our Rule of Life series is all about identifying particular ways that our circumstances are shaping us in harmful ways and then implementing habits or rhythms uh, to fortify us against those shaping influences, but not just fortify us, but also form our faith, enable us to flourish in these particular times and circumstances and places that we live. So today I want to talk about one aspect of human culture that is particularly anti-Christian, yet goes largely unnoticed in our lives and really is compromising our faith in, in some significant ways. The idea of human autonomy is the belief that we have the right to govern ourselves. In other words, nobody can tell me what to do. I do not need to go to anybody for permission. I do not even need to allow someone to influence the way that I think. It is the human autonomy is radical independence and ultimately it is self-sovereignty. Now, there are a few ways uh, that this just goes against Christianity completely. For example, we as Christians know we're not independent. We are, in fact, interdependent. We don't believe that there is no other human authority in our lives. In fact, we practice submission, for example, to the government and mutual submission, for example, to our spouses and to each other as Christians. We also don't believe in self Government, we as Christians very much believe we are under the government of the kingdom of God made available through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we very much live under His government and ultimately we certainly do not believe in self-sovereignty. We believe in God's sovereignty. Now there's one more way that this worldview does not line up with Christianity, and that's what I want to talk about today. We also don't believe that no one or nothing else should tell us what to do or that no one should influence our thinking or the decisions we make. We don't believe that. We actually care very, very much what God thinks about our lives and what He wants us to do in our lives. We actually very much want God to influence our thinking and the decisions that we make. In other words, we care very much about the will of God. Christians care very much about the will of God. And so right up front, let me tell you about our rule of life principle for today. It's simply saying this, instead of individual autonomy in making decisions, instead of individual autonomy in making decisions, we as Christians actively seek the will of God. Now, the million-dollar question is, how do I find the will of God? How do I hear the voice of God directing me in my daily life, right? Because we're going to just pick up the phone. We're going to just write him an email. I wish it was that simple. That's what we're going to explore today. But before we get there, we have to remove some of the clutter around this conversation because the uh, subject of the will of God is rather large and can be quite confusing. So at the beginning of the year, I think it was Sermon January 10, right about there, I divided up this subject of the will of God into kind of three areas comprising the will of God. So firstly, we have God's will of decree. Then we have, we have His will of desire. And then we have God's will of direction. Just a quick reminder, God's will of decree speaks about God's sovereignty, that He rules over everything. 
Everything that happens, happens because God determined it should happen. And everything that God determined should happen does, in fact, happen. And this applies to massive world events, but also the very detail of your and my daily lives. That's God's will of decree, His sovereignty. Secondly, God's will of desire. So if God's will of decree tells us how things are, God's will of desire tells us how things should be. And remember, this is not mysterious. Right? We looked at a passage, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3, which says, for example, like, what is, what is God's desire for me? Well, it's, it's simple. His desire is to grow in godliness or sanctification, as 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3 says. To grow in godliness, to grow in relationship with Him, and to achieve the purposes for which He created us, to be on mission for Him. Easy. You don't have to go searching to find the answer of God's will of desire for you. That's His desire for you. But then comes this third subject, and back then I said we'd talk about it in this series. And that's this part of watch, what direction does God want me to take in a particular situation or decision that I've got to make? For example, this is why I mentioned the metrics and getting the results and looking at studying. I suppose you've already made a decision about what you're going to study this year, but that kind of question, what should I study? Or should I be looking to find a new job? Or I've got these job options. Which option should I take? Or should I marry this person that I've been dating for some time? Should I be looking to move house? What direction would God want me to take here? Now to be clear, we are talking under God's will of direction. We are talking about non moral, not non-ethical decisions. We're not talking about right or wrong. For example, God's will of direction doesn't apply to moral questions such as, you know, I wonder if I should be committing adultery. Right? You don't have to think about that. It is very clear what God's will for you is in that situation. Don't do it. Right? We're talking about the difference not between right or wrong. We're talking about particular situations or decisions where we have to choose between perhaps what's good and what's best. That brings up just another concern that I need to address, and then we'll really get into how to hear for God's will of direction. See, when it comes to the issue of God's will of direction in our lives, there are two equal opposite errors we can make. On the one side is radical separated autonomy. I don't care. I don't need anyone to influence me. I'm going to do what I think is. That's what we're pushing against today specifically is radical autonomy. That is one error. But on the other side is an equal and opposite error. And that is the error where we get kind of caught into such a confusing space where we start to uh, this experience a paralyzing fear about, man, it, what if I don't hear God's particular direction in this instance and don't follow it, then is my whole life going to be messed up because I've missed out on the will of God for my life? And that can be hugely paralyzing and it can filter down to really small decisions and we can really be incapacitated on this end of the spectrum. So when I was a lot younger, around primary school age, I uh, read a lot. I mean, I still read a lot, but I read then a particular series of books uh, like Choose Your Own Adventure books. I don't even know if they still exist today. I suppose computer games are that, but in my day. So Choose Your Own Adventure books was kind of like these books. You'd be reading it, and you're this particular character. So this series I was reading, I think the, if in my mind, the character was like this Mad Max type warrior person. And you'd be reading, and then you'd be, you'd be confronted with a particular situation. Situation. So, for example, a ninja's coming at you with, you know, whatever ninjas come at you with. And you, in the book, you got to make this decision. What is going to be your response, right? So do you, you know, pull out a ninja move or do you talk calmly to him or do you run away? And you have to, you have to go to a particular page of the book, depending on what decision you made about how to confront the ninja, Right? And then you would go, okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take him on. And you turn there, and if it was the wrong choice, it would go, you're dead. And then that's... You close the book, like you're done. And that could be like 
five pages in, into the book. Right? And I feel like, listen, when it comes to the Christian life and discerning God's will of direction for our lives, it's not like a choose-your-own-adventure story where when it comes to non-moral, non-ethical issues, things that have not been clearly written in Scripture, right? God's will of decree for us is not going to be compromised by our fragile decision-making. And so I just want to address that before we even get into discerning God's will of direction for us. Is this paralyzing fear? Because listen, let's be honest, it's not easy to accurately discern God's will of direction. So I came across this quote, Dallas Willard says this. He says, direction will always be made available to the mature disciple if without it, serious harm would befall people concerned in the matter of the cause of Christ. Because listen, hey, guys, you're going to make some bad decisions. I have made, I will still make some bad decisions. Because we as human beings are not omniscient like God is. And we're not omnipotent and omnipresent. We're not omni-anything. It may be omnivores, but we're not going to know everything there is about a particular decision. So we're going to make some bad decisions, but ultimately God will take those choices for those that are trying to follow him, that are leaning into his voice. God takes those decisions, decisions and shapes them for our good under his will of decree. So what I'm talking about in this particular rule of life, so something you want to carry through the year, is not a way of life that should induce anxiety or panic or paralyzing fear. What it should induce in us, this, this way of life is about pushing back against autonomy, but it's also about pushing into trusting a loving and wise God, and it's ultimately about growing in an intimate relationship with Him, just like a child would come to a parent and ask for their advice and opinion or direction that they should take. That's what we're building towards here. So, with that said, here we go. How do we talk about, or how do we understand the subject of God's will of direction? How does God speak to us How does He guide us? How can we know His will in particular decisions that we have to make? So I came across this device a while ago. I think it's quite helpful. I want to talk about God speaking to us in three ways. Uh, W, W, W. Easy to remember. The Word, the World, and the Whisper. So let's start with the Word, which is where we ended off last week. The primary way that God speaks to us is through His Word. And His revealed Word in the Scriptures is our ultimate authority for every decision that we have to make. So when we have to make a decision, the first question we ask is, is this in the Bible? Because we're talking about non-moral, non-ethical Christian issues. So the first question is, well, is it, in fact, a non-moral, non-ethical issue? Let's be careful about that. Because sometimes we may assume that it's not a Christian right or wrong issue. But if you dig a little bit deeper, you'll find often there are some Christian moral issues bound up in it. For example... If you are looking at a new job or you're trying to make a decision, you've got this opportunity at a particular company, you might think that's not a moral decision, except perhaps that company has a reputation or is known for being unethical in its business practices. Well, then it is a little bit informed. Well, it is informed is to some degree by Scripture or that person that you're longing to perhaps date or marry That may seem like a non-moral question, but are they a Christian? This is a subject I dealt with extensively in the Ezra series. 
it is informed by scripture. Or perhaps your desire to sell house and move to another house is that because you want to keep up with the, the lifestyle of your friends. Well, that's informed by scripture. So we always start with the Bible and ask ourselves how the revealed will of God could be and should be influencing the decision that we're going to make. And let me say this. This should not be an individual exercise. I mean, our study of the Word of God and how it shapes us should never be an individual exercise. But in particular, when it comes to decisions that we make. So last week, I mentioned this quote from Tony Reinke, and In it, he spoke about the church. He described the church as an interpretive community. I love that language. I'm going to track back to it in the last part of the series. The church is an interpretive community. Right? We need each other to help us understand how the scriptures are informing, shaping our lives and decisions we need to make. Because all of us as individuals are subject to some dangers when reading and applying the Bible to our own lives could be blind spots. So perhaps it's just areas of our upbringing that we just came to understand as we grew up that, that, that that's just, yeah, that's good, but never really investigated in the Bible. Blind spots or biases. Man, we've got to be aware of this when it comes to making decisions so often. Okay, all the time, we know what decision we want to make. And we're very good at finding a justification for it from the Scriptures. And another danger is simply we can't know the whole Bible on our own. So we need an interpretive community. So part of listening to the voice of God through the Bible to apply in our lives involves speaking to other Christians not just generally for wisdom, but hey, is what I'm reading in the Bible about this decision, is that accurate? That's part of why we need an interpretive community. So that's the word. With the primary way that God speaks to us, our ultimate authority when it comes to God's revealed will for our lives. The word. Number two, the world. Sometimes... A lot of the time, God directs our lives by simply arranging circumstances around us because He is sovereign, remember, of the big things, but also the very detail of our lives. As Christians, when it comes to the subject of God kind of arranging the particular circumstances of our lives, it's the subject of the providence of God, the providence of God is His will of decree enforced in the daily detail of our lives. God does that. He works things around us. God is constantly at work in our lives, steering us and moving us 99% of the time unconvinced without us even knowing it. One day we're going to get to heaven it's gospel according to me. We're going to get to heaven and we're just going to see the thousands of ways God was acting in, in our lives. Perhaps even this morning as I drove to church, God would say, hey, you I mean, remember that? And you, you took that as in, I led you that way. There were thousands of ways that God has worked in our lives. And we will say, man, that was you. It was you when I, when I invited that guy to come to um, the coffee bar for training to use the coffee machine, and that guy invited Kristen, who's now my wife. That was you, God. Thousands of ways. We'll look back one day and go, man, that was God arranging the particular circumstances of our lives in order to steer and guide us in accordance with His will of direction. I love this quote by John Piper. He says, God is always doing 10,000 things in your life, and you may be aware of three of them. He's always doing 10,000 things, and you may be aware of three of them. This is the reality in which a Christian lives God's will of decree through his providence in our daily lives. Now, here's the thing. If we can learn to pay attention to our circumstances, 
kind of an intelligent alertness to what's happening around us in our daily lives and perhaps even the world. It's going to help us see what he's trying to do and where he may be trying to lead us through these circumstances that he is changing for us. In Acts chapter 16, there's this rather bizarre story of the Apostle Paul who has this impulse, this inclination to take the gospel to Asia. I mean, amen. I preach the gospel, that's in line with like the word of God. I mean, it's there in the Old Testament text. It's absolutely right that Paul would be thinking to go and take the gospel to Asia. Except we read that the Holy Spirit prevented them. So he goes, well, okay, well then let's go here. And he moves on to another city and we read again that the Spirit of Jesus prevented them. And I'm thinking, like, what does that look like? What does it look like for Paul? It's not like he was about to cross the border into Asia and there was like this force field that he was like, couldn't, like, what? It practically something happened to physically prevent him getting on the boat to go to Asia. I mean, modern day, like, passport, I don't know, invalid or whatever ever happens. I mean, even in our church, we've seen stories of this play out. And we've got staff of Christine right here is waiting to go to Japan and, and, the, and it's closed for her to go, right? Maybe that's the Apostle Paul being prevented to go. And then <laughs> the crazy part of the story, then he has this dream that night about going to Macedonia. And then he goes to Macedonia and that's where God wanted him to go along. We're not even going to get to God speaking to us through dreams today because my dreams are crazy. I don't even know what to make about them. In Christian circles, you'll often hear Christians talk about this idea of open and closed doors. How God opens particular doors, and if He opens a door in an amazing way, most often it means we should walk through them. And that's, I think, for the most part, wise and true. And if there's something we're really trying to do, but the door keeps closing, then maybe we shouldn't be trying to push it down, but accept that that is God's will of direction. And I suppose that is often true as well. I think for me personally, I'd stay away a little bit from using the word doors because it's often in life not that obvious that there's a very clear, particular open or closed opportunity. Prefer the word circumstances. And really what I'm getting at, looking at this second W here, the world, is this idea that in this habit is urging Christians to pay intelligent alertness to the circumstances that are around us. Instead of rushing through life at a furious pace, unaware to just pay attention to circumstances around us because that could be part of how God is leading us and moving us from one place to another. Okay, number three. I want to spend a little bit more time on this one. So God speaks to us primarily and authoritatively through His Word and by providence through circumstances around us and granted, tricky to interpret sometimes. Then there's a third way. The trickiest and most subjective of all, the whisper. The whisper. And I get that W from, I think, the story that a lot of you will know really well, the story of Elijah, who's kind of in a cave and God wants to talk to him and speaks to him through a whisper. That story is 1 Kings chapter 19. Elijah's in a very bad place. He's at a confrontation with the prophets of Baal. Jezebel's on the hunt, wants to destroy and kill him. And so he's running away. He's depressed. He's disillusioned. Right? He's in a particularly bad space. But God wants to give him a task. He's got a task for Elijah still to do. And God needs to get Elijah's attention. So he's hiding in this cave. And I mean, you'll know the story. God gets his attention through this, the big wind. And you're reading the Bible, but God wasn't in the wind. And then there is this earthquake. And Elijah's like, is that God? And God wasn't in the earthquake. And then there is this fire. And then we read that there is the sound of a whisper. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. This was now God. God. 
wanting to talk to Elijah, giving particular instruction for something he wanted him to do. And I love how Mark Batterson describes this part of the story. He says, We tend to dismiss as insignificant the natural phenomena that preceded the whisper, the wind, the earthquake, etc., because God was not in them. But I bet they got Elijah's attention. I love this part. He says, God has an outside voice and he's not afraid of using it. Particularly relevant, Chris and myself right now, we've got kids and they're shouting and always like, man, use your inside voice. If you're outside, use your outside voice. I love that. But God has an outside voice. Like he can get our attention. But when God wants to be heard, he goes on to say, when what God has to say is too important for us to miss, he often speaks in a whisper. He goes on to describe it as just above the absolute threshold of hearing. And so it's not this audible voice. It's this other, more internal way that God speaks to us. His word is external and the interpretive community is external and circumstances are internal, external. But now we're talking about this internal way. We're talking about this area of the heart of leaning into what is happening in our hearts to, to the world of impressions that we have or inclinations or thoughts that just pop into our minds or crazy thoughts that seem like it couldn't be for me that could be kind of dreams vision type ideas that are just so amazing We're like what do I do with that as Christians particularly in a church like Rosebank Union where we place very highly the authority of scripture this particular subject can make us feeling a little unsettled because it's so subjective it's so internal. It's so open to misinterpretation. The heart is deceitful above all things, isn't it? And it's true. Which is why we first need the gate of the word. It's why we pay attention to the world. But even in the word, even in the Bible itself, we have language for these internal movements of the heart and of the mind. The Bible talks about this came across it in our Ezra series last year. Remember that? Those have been around, but in the very beginning. First one. Ezra 1 verse 5. Remember this. Then rose up the heads of the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit God had stirred to go up to rebuild the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. God stirred up their hearts. And that phrase comes up again and again in the book when God has something particular he wants them to do. He stirred up their hearts. Now just place yourself again in that situation. Here they are in Babylon. God has told them, stay where you are. Seek the welfare of the city that I've placed you into. But at a particular time when the door is open for them to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the city, God says, I want some people to go with me. Who's with me? So there's an open door, but you very much could stay too. That was okay to stay, but God needed people to go. It wasn't in His Word what needed to be done. His Word was still being written. How did God prompt a particular group of people whose names are listed to go? All we have is they felt a stirring in their hearts. It was a real life decision about leaving home, about settling somewhere else, about a particular job. And all they had to go on was this internal location of God's will of direction. Remember this as well. As a Christian, as a New Testament Christian, even the subject of morality... Even the subject of God's law, his covenant, his express will of desire and even decree for our lives. Even when it comes to morality for the New Testament Christian, in the Bible that now has an internal sphere of operation. Jeremiah chapter 31. Got to be one of the key Old Testament texts because it sets up the new covenant, the transition from the old covenant to the new covenant. In the series, we looked a lot at, hey, does this thing that's resting in the Old Testament change in the New Testament? One massive change is even the area of morality and God's commands shifts 
internally. Jeremiah 31. Verse 31 to 33, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, even though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days. This new covenant, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they will be my people. And no longer shall each teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest, says the Lord. And I will forgive their iniquity. It's such a beautiful passage. And it's talking about this internal location of the law of God, which is our conscience as a Christian. When it comes to ethical decisions, we can rely even on that. That's the God's law in our hearts. All that to say, don't discount the internal movings of God's Spirit through things like thoughts, ideas, inclinations, and impressions. Don't discount that. They will always be subject to the Word of God. But where there is no clear guidance in the Bible as Christians... We've got to become well-practiced in hearing this voice. One of the reasons I think is so important why I wanted to emphasize this today is because this area of God prompting us and speaking to us is not just for making decisions. I think it's so important because as Christians, this is the way God uses to nudge us out of our comfort zones because we all just tend to carry on with the status quo of our lives. And if God wants to interrupt that, this is the means he will use. For example, this is what he might use to prompt us to talk to that person about Jesus. That's what he might use to prompt us to offer to that colleague, can I pray for you? That's what God might use to prompt us to help a particular person in need. Those will not come up expressly maybe in the word or circumstances, but it's going to be this prompting. And as Christians who learn to walk by faith, this has got to be a voice that we get to know. And I suppose the question is, man, I mean, how, again, it's so subjective, yes. And all I can say to you is I'm still learning and that this is a process. The only way we get to really know this voice is when you feel like you're being prompted and it, it's not anti-Christian, it's not something weird or strange, go with it. And as you go and as you try and, and, and fail, and you're not failing disastrously, remember that because you're still in God's revealed word, but as you go, as you try and you fail, maybe that was God, maybe that wasn't God. You start to learn, you start to become a lot more familiar with that internal voice. The beauty of this approach, WWW, is if all three of them combine about a particular decision, but if God's word and circumstances and your inclination is pointing in the same direction, then you can move forward with some confidence. But it's not always going to work that way. Sometimes it's just His Word. Sometimes it's an impression and the Word is, is truly, accurately silent on that particular issue. And sometimes, guys, nothing. None of the above. What do you do then? Well, you walk in the wisdom that God has given you, seeking wisdom from other people and go forward in freedom and in confidence. Ultimately, I think, as mature Christians who have rejected human autonomy and are seeking the will of God, we want to seek to grow in hearing God's voice through His Word, His world, and this whisper. So let's commit as a church to a reflective attention to the promptings inside of us. Reflective attention to promptings. Let us commit as a church to intelligent alertness to circumstances. And let's commit as a church to careful 
application of his word to our lives. Remember the passage that Shelley read before the sermon, that John 10 passage about Jesus being the shepherd. And in that metaphor, he's also the door of the sheep, right? The means by which we gain entrance into his kingdom through his death and resurrection. Such a beautiful metaphor. Jesus is the door. But then it switches to he's also the shepherd who loves his sheep, who cares about his sheep, and who directs his sheep to places of pasture. He wants to direct you. And it goes on to say the sheep know his voice. It also warns them there's the voice of the stranger. But they'll reject the voice of the stranger and they will follow the voice of Jesus, the good shepherd. May we grow in knowing the voice of Jesus and having the courage to follow it and in rejecting the other voices around us. Let's pray. And as you gather in prayer, I'm going to pray a really simple prayer this morning that is in our Rule of Life Principles download. It's simply this. Jesus, our King. Jesus, we acknowledge you as King. We are not self-governing. We willingly place ourselves under your governance and the governance of the kingdom of God that you graciously gave us entrance into through your death and resurrection that we could come out of self-governance and governance under evil of the world, the principalities and powers and be under your gracious, loving, wise governance. So we renounce our autonomy and self-sovereignty. We recognize, man, that has not done us good. And we submit ourselves, our dreams and our desires, and ultimately we submit our will to yours. Jesus, help us to live our ordinary, everyday lives in accordance with your will of direction by teaching us to know your voice and granting us the courage to obey. Amen. Our rule for you today, so the two habits that we're going to embrace as a church, so habit number seven in the series as a baseline, we commit to daily prayer about decisions. It's kind of every morning as you're praying, if you journal your prayers, like I do, if there's a decision that needs to be made, it's just tracked there like every day. We commit to daily prayer and at times of major decisions, making every effort not to proceed until we've submitted our desires to God. So that's habit number seven. And habit number eight brings up the idea of fasting, which we're going to do as a church next week, Wednesday. If you don't know what fasting is about, there's a download for you on our website explaining how fasting is connected to hearing the voice of God. So we commit to doing that as a regular practice, and you can join us monthly on the last Wednesday of the month. Lastly, two resources, two resources for you, two books, one of them quite comprehensive uh, by J.R. Packer called God's Will. I recommend that to you and on a much simpler level very quick read for those of you who are readers Mark Batterson got that quote from called Whisper and if you're interested there's a website called at rule.praxislabs.org uh, which is a rule of life and at this particular point was so helpful go and check that out for now let's close out the service as we take a moment to pause perhaps to listen the voice of God stirring in your heart or in your mind as we sing together. Thank you for listening to this sermon from Rosebank Union Church. If you've enjoyed this message, please feel free to share it with others. And if you would like to support the work of Rosebank Union Church, please visit the giving link on our website at ruc.org.za.